happy job. I have no idea how he does all the research that's necessary for these presentations that he makes, but they're always <laughs> terrific. And uh, I know that we're all looking forward to this one, Oscar. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, illustrious, uh, illustrious SGIG and others. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you this evening. Uh, and of course, illustrious Mendoza, thank you again for the uh, invitation. And uh, illustrious Miller, thank you for the introduction. Let me start the slideshow. Where are we? There we go. Okay. And this is working now. Okay, so uh, tonight's presentation is called, uh, interesting enough, <clears throat> I called it Message in a Bottle, the story travel of two important pieces of parchment. And you'll understand, uh, hopefully by the end, you know, why I, why I title it as such. So first, uh, just to put things in perspective, uh, we have a, a, an interesting story that goes um, several continents and across several uh, you know, countries, I should say regions. So we're gonna start in France, uh, find out there's a movement to Haiti and then to Connecticut and then to Pennsylvania. Uh, and you'll, you'll see how these things come into play, the interesting interaction that these, uh, these pieces of paper really made it uh, within our Masonic lore. But first, I'm actually going to kind of begin the story in about um, 1799, 1800. Um, and it's in the island of Haiti, uh, where after the British were kicked out by Toussaint Louverture, uh, you know, Haiti wasn't necessarily, uh, when people say, well, it was a Haitian revolution, there were several revolutions that happened and not just one particular moment. But you found that uh, one of the uh, Haitian uh, big, I guess we said, uh, heroes, local heroes to the extent to Saint Louverture, he actually controlled the north of the island. Uh, and he had a rival named Andre Rigard who controlled the south. So after the fight for independence, essentially, they actually had further uh, intense civil war uh, for total control of the island. So Toussaint, interestingly enough, negotiated a deal with President John Adams, which allowed for Haiti to continue its trade with France because we were actually in a trade war. Um, the US was in a trade war, I'm sorry, Haiti have a trade with, with the US because the US had a trade war going on with France at the time. Um, and as a result, whether it was an opportunity to get gunpowder or you know, goods and commodities, uh, the, the US president essentially said, well, let's, let's get this deal going with Toussaint. Now, as a result, we found that uh, the US Navy had dispatched several of its vessels to actually provide support to to uh, Toussaint by suppressing regards troops in, in that regard. And we see this even in the commanding officer of the Trumbull at the time uh, in 1800 writes about intelligence that said, Regard has a large ship but it has about 20 guns and three small vessels with 14 guns each, but they told them where they were located. Uh, and as a result, uh, Toussaint uh, army was uh, heading in that direction. So in order to provide uh, support, they had asked, um, basically dispatched out to the, the US Navy to, from, uh, to this USS Trumbull to say, you need to go out there and provide basically cover, uh, capture any of Rigaud's um, vessels and of course, you know, provide whatever uh, support that you will get uh, from uh, Toussaint, including whether or not he brings you gunpowder so we can uh, man our, our, our resources. So it's, it's and even you see the further continuation here, the, uh, the commanding officer writes, of course, that it's, it's the whole goal is to ensure that Toussaint gets every service that, uh, that the US has to offer because his rival, uh, they really view as being one of the most cruel and barbarous enemies. A reason because of that, we found, you notice the slide before, had spoken about the War of Knives. The War of Knives is called as such, wasn't just the, the civil war between Toussaint and Rigaud, but Rigaud had actually gone into several of the, um, the, the, the white areas of the island and slayed um, and killed several of the inhabitants uh, by the use of knives and swords. So that's where the War of Knives came about. So as we see, this intense battle fight uh, has occurred. Regard is fighting Toussaint Louverture, uh, getting support from the US Navy. Uh, uh, sorry, 
Jim, you got this? Okay. I, sometimes the when people come into the um, to the waiting room, they interrupt. So I'm sorry. Um, so we see that, and essentially uh, Toussaint ends up getting full control of the island, and Regard leaves, uh, fleeing in exile. Now, as he fled, here's the interesting thing that happened in September 17th of 1800s, uh, the USS Trumbull, which was commanded by uh, David Jewett, uh, captures uh, this French boat called Vengeance, this French schooner. And on it, they found that there were 130 people on board. Several of them uh, were uh, folks who were uh, members of, um, of Rigaud's army, uh, but they were mostly, if not all, actually they were all people of color. Um, and then they caught another ship, uh, which was uh, also uh, supported by, uh, by, carried by people who were uh, members of Rigaud's army, um, and they sunk that ship and put everyone together and essentially brought all these folks with them to Connecticut. And what is very interesting about this is the following bits of information. We found that the men that were on, out of the, out of the passengers who were on that ship uh, in the Trumbull, when they brought them back to Connecticut, one of the unique things that were, or the unique individuals that were on there was this gentleman to the left who was Jean-Pierre Boyer. Jean-Pierre Boyer was a uh, gentleman who was uh, in Regard's army, uh, but he also went on to become the first president of uh, Haiti uh, after Toussaint Louverture. Now, Pierre Boyer had a very uh, intriguing uh, secret that he held uh, in the possessions on that ship. Uh, there were all the Masonic um, uh, furniture, uh, certificates, uh, you know, rituals, and uh, regalia for the lodge of which he uh, and other members on that ship were member were were uh, associated with. So they captured all these people who were men of people of color, uh, and in it they found that uh, they had their Masonic regalia, the Masonic furniture, and every all the accoutrements that you would have for a Masonic lodge um, in their possession. Um, and as a result, we found that the. Uh, the courts decided to separate the groups. Uh, one, one half was sent to one part of Connecticut and the other ones were sent to another area where they served essentially as prisoners of war. Um, and I'll get to these other gentlemen in the course of my conversation, but all of these guys have uh, significant Masonic connections that you will find very intriguing to this particular story. The first is, uh, is David Jewett. He was born in London, New London, Connecticut. Uh, he was the son of uh, Dr. David Hibbert Jewett and uh, his mom was um, Patience Jewett. And he is the grand nephew of another person named Eliphalet Bulkley. I'll get to that in a minute. He was very heavily into uh, the naval um, industry and, and really uh, going through his uh, roles of uh, fighting and, and being in the US Navy, getting his commission at age 19. Uh, upon uh, leaving the Navy, he actually went and served in, in Buenos Aires and parts of um, South America. And he actually married uh, the New York City Alderman's uh, Augustin Hicks Lawrence, who was a charter member of the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and uh, we find that he also became a member of the Cerno Scottish Rite. Who was, which was run by uh, Elias Hicks in New York City, um, who was also uh, a member, uh, son of, uh, I would say, New York City uh, political uh, royalty, being the son of the New York City mayor at the time. Now, v Jewett is known to have received his 33rd in the Cerno Scottish Rite, uh, and he is actually um, recognized as being one of the individuals who helped support the growth of the Supreme Council of Brazil for the 33rd degree. So, why do I say all of that? Because Jewett is the commanding officer of the USS Trumbull. And when the USS Trumbull comes into bear and they provided those folks um, uh, passage to New London, Connecticut, we find that uh, there's another scenario that occurred. Jewett and others filed suit in court to get all of the possessions of the, uh, of the ship, the Vengeance, and claim it as theirs, meaning, you know, it was, uh, it was captured by the U.S. military, so they had the right to say, well, we, de we demand um, access or the ability to claim uh, everything that we caught or everything we captured uh, on the semblance of war. 
and they were awarded uh, many of the uh, materials and the uh, information, I should say, the resources, the, you know, everything, they essentially, whatever the inventory was of that ship, uh, they were able to um, claim it as their own um, out of court. Dia Manon was another interesting brother who lived in New London. And specifically, he and his brother Roger served as bodyguards for General George Washington in Valley Forge. Uh, I say this because while he was known to have been the uh, major drummer at the time, uh, both providing uh, Major Andre, the traitor, with uh, his last meal and, um, and bringing him to his execution uh, to be executed as a spy. Now, what is interesting, he was a member of Somerset Lodge. And when the men were brought in from New London, Connecticut, they permitted the courts and everyone else permitted them to be serve their time as prisoners of war. Um, and interestingly enough, Jean-Pierre Boyer was permitted to be a host, to be hosted by Dia Manon uh, and other members of Somerset Lodge, which was in New London, Connecticut. In fact, he uh, kept uh, Boyer in their home uh, for about 1800 to 1801. Boyer is known to have visited Somerset Lodge, uh, met with brothers, and actually improved his, lang his English language uh, and, of course, uh, being recognized as a Mason, really being uh, interesting from the perspective of here's a prisoner of war. He has freedom to walk around the, the town and he is able to go attend Lodge in that time as well. So it's a really interesting concept. You can see how uh, Masonically Boyer was treated. Now, Boyer ends up going to, after leaving the, the man in his home, uh, in 1801, he goes to New York and then gets sent to Guadeloupe after a treaty was uh, brought on between France and the U.S. Uh, and then later went to France and returned back to Haiti when he become uh, its first uh, president or prime minister, I guess is the word to use. The other gentleman was Eliphalet Buckley. Buckley is interesting because he was also from New London, Connecticut, and he was a prominent officer in the Connecticut troops. He was promoted to lieutenant colonel in 1780 and was a member of Wooster Lodge in Colchester, uh, Connecticut. In 1797 and 1798, Eliphalet was the junior grand warden of the Grand Lodge of Connecticut, but he ends up moving to Wilkes Barre, uh, Pennsylvania in 1806, where he becomes active in that lodge there, Lodge Number 61. Well, why is that of interest? Because the Buckley family has a very unique Masonic connection. As I mentioned, Jewett is related to Bulkley. Um, while Jewett commanded the, tr the Trumbull for a number of years, his lieutenant was his own brother Charles and his brother George and his cousin Jonathan Bulkley served as midshipman on that, on that ship. Jonathan was Eliphalet's son and Jonathan was the one who actually moved to Wilkes-Barre, uh, Pennsylvania, where he got involved in politics and became the sheriff of that Luzerne County in 1824-1825. Jonathan was a long life mason in Wooster Lodge. Uh, and we see Eliphalet, his father, leave in Connecticut to be in the same area with his son and his family, and essentially also uh, join in Wilkes-Barre Lodge number 61. So both Eliphalet and Jonathan were very active in uh, Freemasonry moving from Connecticut into uh, Pennsylvania. I say this because when Eliphalet dies, he gives a copy of the chart, well, he actually gives the charter that he, he gained from Boyer, from the ship, um, to another brother in that lodge by the name of David Scott. David Scott was the president uh, judge of the 11th Judicial District in Wilkes-Barre, and he served in very many uh, social and other uh, political circles. When he died, um, he in turn passed on uh, the charter that he received from Boyer being captured in the ship back in the 1800s. He gives that to a brother by the name of Oscar Jewell Harvey. Harvey was also in Pennsylvania. He himself a lawyer and wrote very extensively. He was a great historian and actually wrote the history of the, uh, the entire area there in Pennsylvania, including that of Lodge Number 61. Uh, when he died, he had a co-author that he worked with by the name of Colonel Ernest G. Smith. And the charter left from Harvey's hands into Smith's family's hands. And the Smith family, particularly that of Harrison Harvey Smith, uh, in about 1955, donates the charter uh, that they had from, um, from John Pierre Boyer 
to the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania's uh, archives and museum. Uh, and here you find the point of this entire conversation. This charter was dated in 1774. And they talked specifically about the fact that this was a very uh, historic document uh, that really passed through the hands of several ownerships from that period of time. I say that because I spent about a year and a half trying to find this document. And I ended up speaking to several of the librarians at the uh, Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, and it was shown in several other archival uh, records, et cetera, but no one, no one could find where it was. No one knew where it was. Uh, in fact, they thought it was pretty much lost or may have been erroneously entered until I got a phone call one day uh, from the Grand, um, the archivist for the Grand Lodge. Sorry, just putting everyone on mute, please. Okay. The archivist for the Grand Lodge, who informs me excitedly that they found the charter. And I said, wow, you found the charter. Where was it? Apparently, they had hid it from themselves. Uh, there was a cabinet in a locked area in the archives uh, that had been... Um, hidden for years and locked for years. No one ever went into it. Um, and it turns out that not only did they find several of Ben Franklin's original writings, uh, which <laughs> was, is quite a treasure, but they found the, the, you know, two charters sitting, sitting in the, in the uh, cabinet. So once they pull it out, they said, I think this is the charter that Oscar was looking for. Um, so I happened to be in Pennsylvania for a conference um, where I uh, rushed over to the uh, Grand Lodge and to the library and they revealed to me this charter. And I'm looking at the charter, hoping to find what is what was it about Boyer and everything else. And it turns out it was the wrong charter. Uh, now, I say that, like, you're like, okay, what do you mean it was the wrong charter? This charter from 1774 actually has a very interest in history. You see, and if you, any of you are Masonic historians or Scottish Rite historians, there was this one point in time where the, in 1915, an article was written in, or I should say a book was written by Julius Sachs, which spoke about the oldest Scottish Rite document uh, in the United States at that time. And it is said to be a charter of uh, Ossian von Verrier, who, which was dated in 1764 and signed by Etienne, or as we call him, Stephen Morin. Um, those of you who know Scottish Rite history could tell why this is a major deal. You see, in this uh, 1916 book, they actually detail the um, the, the write-ins and the description of this charter uh, that was signed by Morin um, and more specifically, you know, the details that show that this was a, an authentic and one of the oldest, uh, earliest, I should say, documents about Scottish Rite uh, with Maureen's signature on it. Now, I say that because going back to the history of the uh, Scottish Rite in the U.S., we're told that the earliest um, action, I would say, of Freemasonry in the U.S. was the Lodge of Perfection that was founded by uh, uh, by Franken in Albany, New York, right? and this is a copy of uh, that uh, charter that is described in, of course, the Lodge of Perfection and, and signed um, by Morin, but of course with uh, Franken's name, uh, giving him the authority to do such. Now, why is this interesting? Because Etienne Verrier, going back to the original point of my uh, search, uh, was known to be a planter that was born in around 1712 in France. He died in 1787 in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, where he was listed as being a planter and also um, his job as a surveyor of the king. Now, going back into all of these documents and trying to find, okay, who's on first? Where, where's this document and why are they linked in some way, shape, or form? I found this 1912 journal, or I should say magazine newsletter written by the Scottish Rite of, the, uh, of New York City. And in it, they describes Etienne Morin's activities and more specifically, the description of this Ossian Verrier uh, charter, which was the one that I was searching for, it turns out. You see, this was the, in the uh, Satch's book, you actually found a photocopy of this document and it was called the Boyer Charter. Now, 
I went back and forth to say, well, why, why is this the Boyer Charter? This doesn't make any sense. Um, and I found basically a full description of the charter for Essien Verrier. And the whole point of this busy slide is really show that Essien Boyer, a plan to live in Port-au-Prince in the island of Saint-Germain, which is Haiti, uh, was a member and treasurer of the Lodge Perfect Harmony in that same town, had received upon him the Grand Elect Perfect and Sublime Scottish Mason, uh, one of the higher grades within, of course, the early Scottish Rite, and that this was given and signed uh, by Etienne Morin on the year 1764. So here we have this charter that was signed by Etienne Morin, dating back to 1764. Um, and this finally, when I got um, to, the, uh, to the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, what they had said was that they were going to, they, they were going to put this into a um, conservationist hands to try to ensure that they can uh, you know, preserve it and make sure that it, 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 lasts, it lasts much longer than being in the closet for a couple decades. Uh, but I was able to get some high resolution images of this uh, charter. Um, and as you can see here, uh, this is Etienne Morin's signature, signs, you know, signing himself off as a uh, Grand Sovereign Grand Inspector General, um, essentially providing uh, and declaring, of course, his uh, ability to uh, both confer these degrees on Ossian Verrier. Uh, on the back of the charter has some interesting um, uh, how do we say, counter signatures. Uh, because what is customary at that time, you didn't walk around for deuce guard, you actually walked around with your certificate. And at times when you visit other lodges, et cetera, you oftentimes would have them, you know, countersigned or, 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 or marked or even becomes a record of your Masonic story. Now, the endorsements on the back were interesting because they show, of course, the Grand Master and Grand Officers of the Scottish Lodge in, in the Cape in Haiti, uh, both signing off on uh, in 1764 that in fact Etienne, I'm oh, sorry, Ossian did receive uh, those degrees. And then we see 1765, how he, re he received in uh, another uh, Scottish lodge, uh, visiting, of course, with the name of the, um, uh, the guy who, let me say, the brother who was the Wishful Master. And then uh, here's an interesting point. In 1766, it says that I, I've been received Prince of Jerusalem in the Scottish Lodge of Perfect Harmony, March 1766. Brother Boyer, major of the regiment of Angie um, and of course, indicated another brother, Brother Lamarck. Uh, and then again in 1775, another endorsement saying that uh, he was examined in the sovereign chapter of Rose Croix um, in another area of Haiti. Um, and, uh, and that was in September 1775. So remember, something that you have to consider when looking at time frames. This was the charter that Boyer and company had on their, in their possession when they were captured in 1800. And what is interesting is the fact that it is tied uh, to, um, you know, well, I should say, tied to this, this planter who was the uh, treasurer of the Lodge of Perfect Harmony, right? So the problem does come into play which Boyer is this? So while you look at the signatures that show up, uh, 1764, uh, 1765, and 1766, this is the issue that I have. Um, technically, if I look at Boyer's age, it isn't the same Boyer that we we're speaking about who was captured um, in 1800s. There was another Boyer who was in fact a military uh, general, a uh, Lieutenant General, who we, I was able to find his records of his regiment, which was before going to Haiti, actually located in New Orleans, um, but he did, he did go to Haiti and was uh, stationed there. And I even found additional uh, references uh, to him when he signed off for other men who had other soldiers who had died uh, in the uh, heat of battle. Um, now, the whole point in all of this was, how do I reconcile this charter as being a Boyer charter? And what, what was, where's this more to the story? What I neglected to tell you was that 
the, mem the members of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania and the archivists said, well, there were two charters. So if you're telling us that this is, the, uh, this is not the Boyer Charter, then there was actually another document that we gave to our conservationists. We thought this was the one you needed. I said, this wasn't the one that I needed, but this is your oldest Scottish Rite document, which they did not realize that they had essentially lost <laughs> to, their, um, uh, to their bookshelves. Uh, they knew that there have been references to have them, Pennsylvania, having one of the oldest uh, Morin signed Scottish Rite document uh, certificates, but they had no idea where it was until I came knocking and asking, could you find this other document? So I had to go back to the magazines. And in 1885, there was a description of the charter that I, I was looking for, uh, not the 1764, but the 1774 charter. And this was actually described um, in uh, the Magazine of American History with Notes and Queries. And when they got back from the conservationists, they were able to uh, send me a copy of this uh, charter. And this was the charter that Boyer had in his possession when he was captured um, on that ship in the 1800s. Um, and what is interesting, it definitely describes, of course, that uh, this is the lodge, uh, the charter for the lodge, for uh, the Chosen Brethren, uh, which is located in the city of Fond du Neg uh, in the island of Saint-Domingue under the Grand Orient at the time, and that these brothers were uh, chartered in 1774 under the Grand Orient of France. Uh, and if you look, you can see, you know, the signatures of the several dignitaries. It's in very pristine condition. Um, and what is interesting is that there's a question of whether or not this was also signed by Morin. If you look kind of closely squint your eyes. The question is, is this an M-O-R-I-N? Of course, there's some, you know, some damage and some uh, washing away of the ink over the period of time. The problem that I have is I don't, I do not believe that this would have been Morin's signature because he was dead by the time 1774 came around. Um, but we know this because if you look at Morin, once again, you have 1767, uh, other uh, copies of uh, charters that he had signed, uh, still, of course, older, I'm sorry, um, coming after the 1764 charter that Prince Finney had in its possessions. But the point of all this, my brethren, is I went looking for one document um, in my search to find out what did Etienne, what did Jean-Pierre Boyer uh, what was the Masonic um, uh, evidence that he had when he was captured in 1800s and how that left from Pennsylvania, it was left from, from Haiti to uh, Connecticut and then got into the hands of Pennsylvania and then ended up in their archives uh, and both having some significant history of themselves and no one having none the wiser of what lay right right under their noses uh, with respect to both Scottish Rite history and Masonic history as well. I'll end there. Thank you so much, Oscar. Uh, God, there's a lot to distill. <laughs> it really is. Um, Don Archer, you had your hand up earlier. Um, I opened, I don't, go ahead and open your mic and uh, go, I'm, you had a question for, um, for, our, for our illustrious brother, Oscar? You don't have a question. Yeah. Okay, so I will no. lower your hand. Are you there? Go ahead. I was Go scratching. Ahead. Okay. I will lower that again. So does anybody, uh, again, a lot to distill, but I'm. let's open the floor for any questions that, any, that, that any, anyone might have for, for, our, for our illustrious visitor. Just going to kind of scan the room here. Uh, John Brett, go ahead and unmute your mic. Thank you very much for the lecture, Oscar. I appreciate uh, the background knowledge that you have there. Uh, I have a curious question. Uh, we here in the United States tend to think of most of the lodges uh, coming from Europe and uh, being military lodges originally, the blue lodges that I'm speaking of, uh, were the lodges that you referred to, did, was their ancestry, ancestry associated with the military lodges? Uh, or were they something that was actually founded in, in the United States after uh, several lodges, uh, after the, the uh, uh, revolution took place, uh, there were lodges that began to be formed internally, most of them, a great number of them by New York in the beginning. My question though is, 
were they was was the background associated with the military lodges or was it from American made lodges later on? Which ones you're talking about? You remember we, we spanned four countries, right? Or yeah, I did. We spanned three sorry. countries. Yeah. 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 The, um, so go ahead. No, which 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 one are you asking about the military lodge? When you were uh, Haiti, about, or Haiti or, or Pennsylvania? Okay. In Haiti, in Haiti originally. Okay, so in Haiti, they had several military lodges that did establish themselves earlier on, but because they had settled in those particular, in that country, and it was one of, you know, France's, um, um, uh, you know, possessions, uh, there were several lodges that were French lodges where the members of those lodges were individuals who lived in, in, in Haiti. Sure. So they were not military lodges. They were established, um, and there were several of them uh, that existed over the course of time. Hmm. Some still exist still now, as far as tra ah. tracking their history uh, back to the Grand Orient of Haiti. Interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. No problem. Or and some of them the moved around. I'm sorry, brother. Give me one second. And some of them moved around. So you actually saw a couple of things that was not mentioned in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania at one time was the first American Grand Lodge to yes. charter lodges in Haiti. In Haiti. Ooh, I didn't know that. Yes, yes yeah. they charter lodges in Haiti. While So remember, I mentioned all these revolutions that were occurring. Mm -hmm. So the French held possession of the Masonic you know, world in that time in Haiti. The Brits actually at one point in time did take over Haiti um, and essentially there was a back and forth. So the Brits actually founded some English lodges in Haiti, but Pennsylvania was one of the first lodges at that same time that was competing with the French lodges and wow. it chartered lodges in Haiti. Uh, they lasted for about three to five years, but of course revolutions happened and essentially people packed up and just dispersed or just you know just lost lost contact but um there were several lodges that were charted in haiti uh by the pennsylvania grand lodge so all of this connection is just so weird because they didn't even get it directly it came through you know going through connecticut just even getting the boyer charter hmm. thank you thank you yep i'm sorry brother i interrupted you god i was actually going to go on to his question a little bit were the individuals that you were speaking on were those the military lodges Lodges, or were they pretty much? Was it a military operation from the military? Were were the individuals that you were talking on? Were they from the military lodge or a military operation? Two different things. So remember, Ossian Verrier was a planter. So he was he was he was a civil servant. He was not a military officer. He was a member of the lodge and the treasurer of the lodge in Haiti. Right. The reason the reason the lodge material got captured and transferred was because of the revolutions that occurred, whereas Rigaud's um, army lost to Toussaint and they captured the ship, the Vengeance. On the ship were all these military and other families and others, and inclusive of that were their Masonic material. So there were men who were military officers that were member of that lodge that carried their lodge materials with them when they were captured by the Americans. And then when they were transported to Connecticut, uh, essentially the, uh, the men that were um, associated in that area were also, I mean, most Americans, they were enlisted uh, in the Revolutionary War and of course in, in several aspects. So you had a military presence because they were ship fair men, they were in the Navy, and then they moved um, into uh, Connecticut, I'm sorry, into Pennsylvania uh, and established themselves there. So it, it wasn't a military lodge that started this whole thing, but the men who were Masons that were in the military and through those, those, um, those physical interactions uh, were able to get that information transferred one, from one part of the world to the other. Does that make sense? I don't know. I don't know. You know, Oscar, I'm always fascinated by documents that that last this long and that pass from hand to hand to hand. Um, now, when when people get when some of these people got captured, and the Masonic documents were 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 were, 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 were seen, there's a whole lot of providence that exists there. When somebody says, "Okay, this is a valuable document," because that that document could have easily just been destroyed, right? Yes, that was what's so surprising that, well. Just even, as I said, when I throw that map up of where, you know, because it originated in France, got its way to Haiti, because even, well, technically, all those, both of those charters 
were chartered by France, the Grand Orient of France. And they were essentially uh, given and sent in to Haiti for establishment of either the brothers who were in masonry or the lodges that were chartered at that time. And then from there to leave uh, Haiti in the 1700s through this all this strife um, and, 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 um, and battles, et cetera, and to make it into the U.S., also, you know, captured prisoners of war. It only it only happened that uh, by divine providence, I would say that uh, Boyer was able to um, enjoy the benefit of Freemasonry in Somerset Lodge. You know, he obviously talked about masonry, shared his, his material and et cetera. Um, and he did gift uh, the family um, when he came back, when he went back to Haiti, he did send them money thanking them for, you know, keeping him at that period of time. But you are right. The fact that that document could survive and move through so many different hands and still be preserved, you know, someone obviously realized there was some, some special aspect for it. And the second one with, with Ossian Verrier, you know, having that old document from 1764, as far as we know, the oldest in the US um, that is a more signed document, uh, even older than what Franken has, also tells us that, wow, you never know where, where these things end up. And like I said, it's just two pieces of parchment. It may be meaningless to anyone else in the outside world, but just this story and that connection to masonry through several states and countries, it's what was so intriguing. I mean, you, you take a look at people's in personal documents, you know, people, people yeah. lose their birth certificate. <laughs> now, I, I know the brother secretary was on here from the Valley, but um, what the brothers in the Valley of Philadelphia told me once I did this presentation for them, because uh, everyone's like, what, what, we found this. <laughs> An old school secretary said, wait a minute, that was that, that, that charter, which was the 7064, that charter was always hanging behind my desk as a secretary office. I just never knew what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? Um, it, it, it sat behind his desk, like, you know, hung behind his desk in the Valley's office, and he just had no clue. He just like, um, you know, I had no clue what this was. I didn't realize. But, you know, because, ahead, John. Of, because of where Haiti is and the weather as we know it today, I'm sure there's been 150 uh, hurricanes that got across the islands down there. Uh, and it's probably luck that the charter was actually moved to Connecticut and eventually down to New York and, and uh, Pennsylvania because it may not have survived. God knows how much of, uh, of the older things of that age, a couple hundred years worth, uh, that have just flat disappeared because of the hurricanes and the terrible weather they have down there. So yes. it's a bit of luck that you could actually catch up with it and that they found it and were able to identify exactly what you were looking for. I mean, the, the writing could have disappeared just because of the sun coming through the window. Uh, in the secretary's office. So a bit of luck, a bit of luck. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, now that you basically define what these documents are to, to, to the Grand Lodge, to, to, to the Grand Lodge pen, what are they doing with them now? <laughs> so they are, they're showcasing them. Uh, as I mentioned, they put them both in conservation in the hands of conservationists to make sure that they will be preserved for much longer, you know, not just thrown in a, in a regular frame, but put in a proper um, treated and, you know, preserved to the extent high resolution copies of the maid. Uh, and they're going to display them more prominently in their, in their museum and archive, uh, specifically both for the content and the age uh, and both with the story as well. They've asked me to um, basically submit my presentation as kind of a formal write-up. Uh, to add to you know their their storyline to it, um, so I, I think they're they're going to have it more prominently along with the Ben Franklin materials and things that they had no idea that they had. They were just sitting in a in a dusty closet, um, well not dusty because it was preserved, but it's just sitting in the closet. You know they they they've 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 taken a new life to for lack of a better word. That's awesome. And on a parallel note, should you be so fortunate. You'd be you'd be taking an obligation. You'd be taking a, a certain obligation on on another valued document uh, if, you, if you're if you're so fortunate. <laughs> yeah, let's get there first. <laughs> <laughs> under, under, get, believe me, I, I get it. But uh, I've actually I've actually I've actually been in the Grand Lodge, New York. I pulled out my camera, and the senior Grand Deacon was very quick to stop me. <laughs> he, he was not going to let me take a picture of that of of, of that Bible. I remember that. <laughs> Does anybody else have anything for our, for, for our, our, our illustrious visitor? I'm, uh, this is just so cool that, that again, I, I thank you so much for taking time.
Uh, I know that, uh, you know, it's well, number one, it's three hours on the, uh, you're on the other side of the, of the nation. So you're three hours away and, you know, your, your job at the fight against COVID, uh, for those who didn't get the cha a chance to read his biography, he is the pro director of programs for the National Association of City and County Health Officials. So he's like right there on the front lines, making sure things are happening. So thank you for, for thinking of us. I, I, I do appreciate that. No, so I enjoyed um, it. Again, before I let Oscar go, I just want to make sure that and, and that no one else has a question at all. I want to make sure of that uh, Jim Turtlelock, please. I have a uh, I have a personal connection and uh, a, a question. Uh, I actually grew up in the state of Connecticut um, in a town called Marlboro, which uh, where I lived was about three miles from the the town square in Colchester. Um, and so I've been there many, many times. Uh, my question was, uh, were you able to track the brothers uh, once they arrived in Connecticut to see, uh, did they, or were they able to continue their Masonic uh, uh, labors there in Connecticut? So the primary focus was on uh, Boyer because he was basically their biggest prize um, and everything basically went with him. Uh, so of the, of the, the other Masons that existed in that group, we do know that several settle in areas a little west of, of New London, but New London did have a significant um, enclave. So they parsed them into two groups. And uh, from our understanding that, you know, those families either remained, stayed and, and uh, transitioned into, you know, life in Connecticut. Uh, but the primary attention was placed on Boyer because of his status and his stature stature as being this great general that um uh, that was in regards army and who later on you know was uh they they had the how do you say this the prisoner swap you know when they when they moved them back into new york and then did a formal exchange with the treaty of the the end of the, the treaty of the war between uh france and, and the u.s you know they essentially exchanged their prisoners and and that's where boyer went back um so with respect to the others, um, not much is said more of them other than, of course, the top, the top individuals that they really took back to France and then who went back to Haiti. And in that area in Connecticut had a lot of, uh, Connecticut historically has had significant um, connection. Um, there's another bit of research that I've done in the 1800s where we see that an entire group of Masons um, in Connecticut essentially left to repatriate back to Haiti uh, because Haiti um, and Boyer actually had pushed a back to Africa movement where um, for, you know, people of color were able to say, you want to come to, you want to come settle in Haiti, you're free, you don't have to worry about the racism and the prejudice, you just come move back to Haiti and roughly about, or move and settle in Haiti and we'll give you land, roughly about 15 to 20,000, um, you know, African Americans and others um, did move to Haiti, some died because of the weather change and, you know, uh, and the uh, climate, uh, some did come back. Uh, but there's been this this back and forth between Connecticut and Haiti that has been existing for several years. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you. No problem. Just want to scan the room if there are any other hands that are going up. I want to just make sure things. Oscar, it looks like we're going to we're going to give you a chance to get a little sleep tonight. <laughs> By the way, I'm a, I, I'm a I understand owl, so you don't sleep. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what Steve Rubin tells me, that you don't sleep. <laughs> Any of it, uh, again, illustrious earth, right, worst for brother. Thank you so very much uh, for spending your time with, the, with us this evening, uh, for, uh, again, gracing us with your presence and, and providing us with, uh, with some great knowledge. I mean, there's a lot that we don't know about our fraternity. And so the more, you can, the more we can learn about these things, the better. Um, and, I, and I thank you again for the invitation. I know at times you may say, well, he talked to us about two, two charters, two certificates, you know, what does it matter? I mean, it, it's sometimes I would say that you, you know, um, the role of an archivist and a, and a, a um, librarian sometimes seems mundane, but just to hear such a story 
between two pieces of document that seem to have parallel connections, but um, of course, you know, ends up in a Masonic, uh, you know, shelf, but having such a great centuries, I would say, of, of history um, is something that I think, you know, we can have pride in about the preservation of the Scottish Rite, because they were Scottish Rite documents, to be honest. <laughs> Absolutely.